I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 11 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on this matter of public urgency, which is about not spending public money to open up the Beedaloo Basin, which would turbocharge the climate crisis that our, our globe is already in. Now, sadly, uh, we know that there was almost um, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars of public money committed in the budget to open up the Beedaloo Basin. And perhaps even more sadly, we know that the opposition also supports opening up this basin. Now, I want to make a few points about what a bad idea this is. Not only is it a climate bomb, not only will it have an enormous threat to 90 per cent of the Northern Territory's groundwater systems, but there is no consent from the traditional owners for any of this gas mining, this fracking, this extraction from their land. Now, that should be enough to stop this proposal in its tracks, but uh, as we all know, the laws do not provide any protection for First Nations people to um, have any sort of determination over what happens on their land. Um, but it should provide pause to this government and the opposition that the First Nations owners of this part of the territory do not want fracking on their land. They do not want their groundwater jeopardised and they do not want the world's climate stuffed up. Um, that hasn't provided any pause to this government because they've allocated so much public money. Um, $175 million for roads in and out of the Beedaloo Basin. Um, a number of uh, dollars for, uh, in fact, $1.1 billion of new spending, um, 16 million of which is for so-called strategic gas basins, including the Beedaloo and $50 million for actually drilling in the Beedaloo. I mean, is this government going to actually get in there and drill gas fracking wells for the company themselves? I mean, frankly, they are essentially bankrolling the whole project. Um, but it's very interesting to see who is, in fact, undertaking the project and who's going to benefit from this largesse of public funds. Uh, two billionaires are set to profit in particular. Surprise, surprise. And the big energy companies pushing this, uh, many of whom are actually donors to the Liberal Party. Again, blow me down with a feather. So the companies are comprised of uh, people that have been accused of tax dodging, Gemina and Santos, um, people who donate to the Liberal Party, Origin, Santos, Empire Energy and Jacaranda, uh, billionaires Gina Reinhart um, and Dale Elphinstone, and Liberal Party luminaries Paul Elsby. What a bunch of folk to get public money to open up a gas basin against the wishes of the traditional owners that will turbo turbocharge the climate crisis that we're in and potentially wreck 90 per cent of the groundwater of the Northern Territory. So fracking the Beedaloo will increase Australia's emissions if it goes ahead by at least 8 per cent, possibly up to 23 per cent. It is that much of a carbon bomb. And we just had the G7 yesterday say not only should we be not funding uh, more fossil fuel subsidies, not more fossil fuel projects with public money by 2025, but we should have strong emissions reductions targets by 2030, at least double what this government is proposing, and the opposition doesn't even have a 2030 target. So Australia is flying in the face of the rest of the world in wanting to sink um, a quarter of a billion dollars in public money to open up a climate bomb that would wreck the groundwater against the wishes of the traditional owners of that land. It is hideous. You could not think of a worse proposal. Um, naturally, it's for the benefit of the big corporations that either donate to the Liberal Party um, or have other links to it, but the Australian people will not let this fly. They want genuine action on the climate. They want renewable energy investment and they want the wishes of First Nations owners respected. Thank you. Senator Rennie. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> and I'd just like to touch on, first of all, Senator Waters' uh, comments about public money being used 
uh, for energy projects in this country because uh, the Morrison government has committed billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, to renewable energy, uh, not the least $10 billion in the Clean Energy Fund, uh, $5 billion in the Snowy Hydro, uh, $3.5 billion for the Climate Solutions Package, another $2.5 billion for a Emissions Reduction Fund, uh, $1.5 billion for the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, another $1 billion for a grid reliability fund that has now become another fund, and of course half a billion dollars for the hydrogen strategy. Now, so that comes to about $24 billion all up. So I think it's a bit hypocritical, and I mean, I'm happy, you know, my, my view is either you nationalise the energy market or you let the market rip. But this idea where we go around subsidising uh, energy producers, regardless of the sort, type of energy, uh, is not on. So, I will agree. I mean, I think the private industry should pay their tax, and if they make money, they should pay money. And anything that we put in terms of roads to enable this to happen, I'm, I'm more than happy to argue that they should pay uh, their fair share of tax on that. However, the Beetaloo Basin does have over 200,000 petajoules of shale gas in place. So, to put that in perspective, Australia currently uses 1,920 petajoules a year. Uh, both for uh, domestic use and uh, export, uh, export. So there is over 100 years of gas just for Australia uh, in the Beetaloo Basin. So you know we'd be mad not to use our own natural resources uh, where we can. We we cannot rely on wind and solar alone. It's it's intimate energy, and ultimately it's it's not renewable, uh, and uh, it's not clean either, which I'll, I'll talk about in a money in a minute. Um, the other thing I, I would like to talk about, however, is this allegation of it being a climate bomb and, in particular, uh, the description of methane as being a dangerous climate heating gas. Now, we've got to get over this notion that greenhouse gases are somehow warming the planet. Okay? What warms the planet is the sun, and the scientific equation for that comes under E equals mc squared. 600 million tonnes of hydrogen are burnt every second and converted into 596 million tonnes of helium and 4 million tonnes of energy. And that energy is transported in the form of a photon to planet Earth. Not all of it, but some of it comes here in planet Earth. And Depending on where it was created in the sun, if it was created internally in the sun, in the middle of the sun, it can take up to 170,000 years just to get out of the sun. And then once it's out of the sun, it takes about 8 minutes and 20 seconds to get here. But that'll have a lot less energy of a photon created on the edge of the sun. Uh, we will get here with a lot of energy and that will come either as an ultraviolet uh, ray or a gamma ray, <clears throat> and that'll have a lot of energy, hence why you know, we've got to stay out of the sun, uh, because ultraviolet light will knock out a, an electron. Um, it's got that powerful uh, ionising effect, uh, and hence could cause cancer. But the stuff that the infrared radiation, which is on the other side of the vis uh, visible spectrum, uh, two parts. You've got near radiation uh, and thermal uh, radiation. The near radiation, infrared radiation, is the incoming stuff. The thermal stuff is the outgoing stuff. Um, and methane, interestingly enough, is actually, even though it stays in the atmosphere for about 20 years versus supposedly carbon dioxide for 200 years, but that ignores the photosynthesis effect and lots of it gets absorbed by the ocean to create corals of all things, um, does actually emit at about 8 microns versus 15 microns for carbon dioxide, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but interestingly enough, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd just talk a little bit about the science because we often hear people say how they believe in the science. Well, you don't believe in science. You either understand it or you don't. Science isn't a cult. It's not a faith. You've got to actually understand the science. Now, when it comes to heat, we've got three forms of heat transfer, convection, conduction and radiation. Now, I'd like to quote a paper actually that was released in 1917 um, that talks about uh, the quantum theory of radiation. Um, that happened to be uh, put out by a bloke by the name of Bert, Albert Einstein. Um, and interestingly enough, in this paper, he concludes that, uh, if I just go there, the momentum transferred by radiation is so small that it always drops out as compared to that from other dynamic processes. Um, and if I just refer, so what that basically means is that radiation has such a minimal impact that it's basically neg negligible uh, in the overall. Uh, transmission of energy um, on planet Earth. Uh, and interestingly enough, he says at the start, um, and I love to quote these scientists because we're told we've got to believe the science. Well, here's the science um, that you know molecules uh, will acquire as a result of their mutual interaction by co by collisions. So interestingly enough, 
And he goes on in this paper to talk about well, nitrogen and oxygen, which make up over 95 per cent of the atmosphere, they're also heated up as well. So given that they don't emit radiation, how is it that these things heat up and, uh, you know, if, if, if radiation is such a powerful effect? And effectively, they heat up because the major form of heat transfer in the environment is convection and conduction. So lots of, you know, about 8 million collisions a second go on, that's, that's conduction. And then convection is basically where the wind and the evaporative cooling from the ocean and everything basically cools the planet. Now, the reason why we need to understand that is because, unlike climate theory, uh, you know, climate science theory, and that's all it is, it's a theory, uh, there is actually a true science that's been around for about 200 years, and that's the science of heat, which is called thermodynamics. And there's two laws in that that really, really matter. First applies to conduction, the first law of thermodynamics, and that says that the heat can neither be, uh, energy can neither be uh, destroyed uh, or created, only transformed or transferred. Uh, and that's important because when we have a collision with molecules, whatever one molecule, whatever one molecule lo loses in energy, the other uh, molecule gains. But overall, there is no increase in energy in the system because ultimately energy is kinetic energy which, when we talk about heat, is kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, which makes a mockery of the whole climate science carbon dioxide traps heat, because nothing traps heat. As per the Stefan Boltzmann laws, everything absorbs and radiates, absorbs and radiates. So this idea that you know, carbon dioxide is up there and it's sucking up all this heat is absurd. And if it was sucking up all this heat, the question is you've got to ask yourself, given that it's been around for three and a half billion years, why we just don't get hotter and hotter? And of course, the answer to that is, is that effectively um, it emits as well. Now, then we go to the second form and the major form of heat transfer in the atmosphere, which is convection. And that's the second law of thermodynamics applies to that. And yet again, I, I emphasise the word law as opposed to theory, because laws have been proven through empirical science. Um, and that basically says the entropy of a system must always increase. Now, what does that mean? That effectively means that if I've got half a cup of water here at 10 degrees, half a cup of water here at 20 degrees and I pour one into the other, it'll average out at 15 degrees. Well, it's a bit like the atmosphere. If you turn those two cups uh, on their side, uh, effectively whatever heat is uh, emitted downwards by the so-called greenhouse gases, convection, will naturally balance it out. Why? Because the atmosphere is based basically one big pressure gradient based on temperature differentials. And any change in the pressure or the temperature will always seek to increase the entropy of a system. So, as I said, if you're putting heat downwards, so if we've got those two cups on their side and your carbon dioxide's radiating, da radiating downwards and suddenly the bottom cup increases to 21 degrees, mm. and using the first law of thermodynamics, that means the upper cup will go back to nine degrees. If you combine them two again, it still averages out at 15 degrees. So, long story short, uh, we really have to stop scaring the world with this whole climate change mantra because the climate has always changed and the earth has always been able to balance it out uh, as a result of the atmosphere, pressure gradients, evaporative cooling and so on. Now, the other thing that I want to touch on here is, of course, the idea, you know, the proposed solutions to all of this is somehow renewable energy. Well, let me tell you, there is nothing renewable, renewable about lithium. Lithium is a 1 per cent ore body. What does that mean? That means that you've got to mine 100 tonnes of ore to get one tonne of metal. Now, these ore bodies don't sit in the ground in a nice, perfect shape where you can go in and just uh, dig it up. You've actually got to go around and around and around. So when you see those mining pits, those mining pits will probably be 10 size, times the size of the ore because you can't just, you know, you've got to get down to the ore, so you've got to have, you can't just have a big truck driving down the steep gradient. So you might have to shift 1,000 tonnes of dirt just to get one tonne of metal. Now, that metal lithium, to get that actually out of the ore, has got to go through four intensive uh, electrolysis processes before it's even ready to be put into a battery, right? And that's just one half of the battery. You then got to use a graphite uh, as the cathode, so then you've got to dig all that up as well. Now, interestingly enough, a, a guy by the name of Richard Hetherington, who's the uh, head of the natural uh, sciences uh, in Earth Sciences in the Natural History Museum, he says just to power the UK fleet, you're going to have to use half the world's uh, 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 available copper, the entire uh, amount of the uh, world's available lithium, um, and about three quarters of the world's uh, available cobalt. So it's just never going to happen. Thank you. Um, Senator Watt.
Uh, Madam Deputy President, it's always good to follow Senator Rennick, uh, the Senate's own Julius Sumner Milner, um, giving us all a version of a science lesson, um, just like he does at Senate Estimates as well. Um, this, this debate is an important one. It's about uh, a particular basin in the Northern Territory, and it's also more broadly about the gas industry and its future in Australia. Uh, I thought it was important at the outset to put on the record what Labor's position actually is on the gas industry, because we hear a lot from people in this chamber and people in the media about what Labor's position allegedly is, and it's about this and it's about that. Um, so, for the benefit of Senator Seselger and other people, our friends in the Greens, our friends in One Nation, our friends in the LNP, um, I thought I'd actually enlighten you on to what Labor's policy is, because if you'd actually bothered to pay attention and have any uh, observe Labor's national conference earlier this year, our position on the gas industry was made crystal clear, and it's been made crystal clear ever since. So here, are, here, here this is the direct quote from Labor's national platform. Labor recognises and supports the critical role that gas plays in the Australian economy. Labor recognises that gas has an important role to play in achieving Labor's target of net zero emissions by 2050. Labor's policies will support Australian workers in the gas extraction industry, building on Labor's legacy of supporting sufficient and affordable gas supply for Australian industry and consumers. This includes support for new gas projects and associated infrastructure, subject to independent approval processes to ensure legitimate community concerns are heard and addressed. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, pretty clear. Uh, so for anyone out there who is actually interested in what Labor's position on gas is, I'd encourage you to maybe not worry too much about what the LNP says Labor's policy is, what One Nation says Labor's policy is, what the Greens say Labor's policy is. You know what? It might actually be a good idea to go back to the original source document and look at Labor's platform. And there it is. Very, very clear. So what that policy means in practice is that Labor does support the gas industry. We support the jobs in the gas industry. We support the expert on, uh, earning, export earnings in the gas industry. And we also support strong environmental protections applying to that industry, as we do for any resource or other industry in the Australian economy. Labor does recognise that gas has an ongoing role to play when it comes to firming and peaking electricity, as well as being an important feedstock for manufacturing. As I say, Labor supports the jobs created by our gas sector, in particular those 17,000 who are already employed in the industry and also the role that the industry plays in creating economic growth and export income earnings. Labor will support new gas projects that meet all regulatory requirements and that stack up environmentally and economically. Any new exploration must of course be done safely with widespread genuine community consultation and importantly consultation must include consultation with traditional owners as a priority to ensure that cultural heritage and the natural environment of country is protected as a matter of importance. Um, we will always assess public spending for gas or any infrastructure being funded by government on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that Australians are getting value for money and are not being ripped off uh, by this government and its own preoccupations. Now, the energy debate in this country and I suspect we'll see a bit more of that this afternoon, is too often dom dominated by loud voices on the extremes of each argument touting all or nothing opinions. Labor does not take that approach. As I've made clear, we support the gas industry and we support our resources industries generally and the jobs that they create. But unlike the government, we also acknowledge that climate change is real, uh, that we need to take action to combat it, and that one of the best ways we can do so is to genuinely support the expansion of renewable energy in this country. Now, to think, as some do, that gas is not going to play a role in our transition to renewables is, quite frankly, unrealistic. We will need reliable energy sources to back up our renewables industry as it grows and until we have the technology for it to power the grid alone. If you talk to anyone who knows anything about energy in this country, renewables, uh, uh, while we want to see them go ahead in leaps and bounds, will require firming, whether it be by gas, by pumped hydro or by batteries, for some time to come. So gas will have an important role in backing up those renewables even as we expand their use. 
As I say, gas is also important as a feedstock for manufacturing and for the jobs that come with it. Uh, but of course, we also know on the Labor side that uh, the need for action on climate change is urgent. Every single day we have reminders of that, whether it be what we see in the climate or what we see in expert reports warning us of the dangers if we do not take action on climate change and drastically reduce our emissions. Um, that's why Labor, for some time now, has committed uh, to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. That is the best thing that we can do as a country contri to contribute to the global fight against climate change. And I might note uh, that we are not alone in supporting uh, net zero emissions by 2050. In fact, most of the key bodies and companies involved in the gas industry in Australia also support net zero emissions by 2050. The peak body for oil and gas, APIA, supports net zero emissions by 2050. Santos and Origin, two of the biggest gas producers and exporters in this country, support net zero emissions. And of course, it goes beyond the gas industry to pick up the big mining companies like BHP and Rio Tinto and the National Farmers Federation speaking on behalf of real farmers in this country as opposed to people like the National Party who pretend they speak for farmers. Uh, and this is where it's on this point. Uh, net zero emissions and the need for strong action on climate change that the Morrison government fails time and time again. What their energy policy even is is still a mystery to most of us. It's time the Morrison government made a serious commitment to renewable energy in this country. We are falling further and further behind on energy and climate policy to a point where if you speak to gas or mining companies, as I do on a regular basis, they will tell you that they have given up on this government and they're just getting on with it. They've all adopted net zero emissions by 2050 because they know that's the direction the world is taking and they want to be able to compete in that environment. Um, they are leaving this government in the shade uh, while it continues with its ideological preoccupations and its own internal divisions on matters like climate change. Um, these companies, uh, whether it be in the oil and gas industry, the mining industry, in agriculture, in many other extractive industries, are getting on with the job, are moving ahead and recognise the need for action on climate change, including a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. Industry can see that this is the logical and rational thing to do. It's just a shame that we don't have a government in Australia who can do so as well. Now, Australia is perfectly poised to take advantage of the opportunities in renewables, both domestically and overseas. We have an abundance of sun, wind, water and critical minerals, and frankly, we should just start using them properly. Let's look, for instance, at northern Australia. There are critical minerals present in the north, which are needed to manufacture batteries, solar panels and wind turbines. There is a massive opportunity in northern Australia not only to mine these minerals, but to process them, export them and even create our own advanced manufacturing industry, where it's Australia that builds batteries, builds solar panels, builds wind turbines, rather than exporting these minerals only to see other countries value-add, create jobs producing products which we then import. We can do it in Australia. We could do it in Australia if only we had a government that was prepared to pull its head out of the sand, recognise that there are, there are jobs and dollars to be made by tackling climate change, as well as the obvious environmental benefits that come with it, and to allow Australians to actually seize those jobs rather than offshoring them to other countries. Similarly, we are well positioned to, de to develop use and export hydrogen. Uh, even in my own state of Queensland, places like Townsville and Gladstone are at the forefront nationally of grabbing these opportunities in hydrogen and creating jobs for North Queenslanders and Central Queenslanders. Why does this government not want to see those jobs go into places like North Queensland and Central Queensland? Why does this government want to continue sticking its head in the sand, ignoring the reality of climate change, ignoring the jobs and export opportunities that come with tackling uh, climate change? Why does this government want to see these jobs go offshore to other countries who are recognising these challenges rather than have them in places like North Queensland and Central Queensland? And I know the same can be said about places in Victoria, Western Australia, Tasmania and pretty much every state in the country. Where is the federal government on these issues? 
When are we going to have a federal government that tax tackles uh, climate change seriously, that grabs the job opportunities, that has a sensible policy about energy, that recognises that gas will have an ongoing role to play for some time to come and supports the jobs in that industry, but at the same time grabs the incredible opportunities that we have in solar, in wind and other forms of renewable energy? It's not difficult. All it requires is for people to get over their ideological preoccupations. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to discuss this issue, which at its core, quoting from the Greens, is about climate heating. Really, about humans heating our climate. One Nation relies upon data, facts and empirical evidence proving causation. Senator Watt relies upon belief. Let's have a look at some data on another issue, and that is the Greens' claims. On the 9th of September 2019, I invited Senator Waters and the then leader, Senator Di Natale, remember him? I invited them to present us with the empirical scientific evidence proving that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. I also challenged them to a debate on the empirical evidence and on the corruption of science. What have we heard since? Nothing. Not a thing. Just more claims, more beliefs. On the 7th of October 2010, I invited Senator Larissa Waters, who is now the Greens leader in the Senate, to debate me on climate and climate science corruption. She jumped to her feet and said, I will not debate you. Six years later, in May 2016, five years ago, I challenged her again, along with the Labor Party, and again she won't debate me. She won't debate me because they haven't got the facts. So let's go instead to someone who used to be part of the Obama administration, Stephen Coonan, or should I say Professor Stephen Coonan. He's written a book called Unsettled, and he says, quote, Heat waves in the US are now no more common than they were in 1900, 121 years ago. Secondly, the warmest temperatures in the US have not risen in the past 50 years. So much for warming. Thirdly, humans have had no detectable impact on hurricanes over the past century. These are facts. These are things that I have spoken about in the past in this chamber. Professor Coonan continues, tornado frequency and severity are also not trending up, nor are the number and severity of droughts. The extent of global fires has been trending significantly downward. The rate of sea level rise has not accelerated. Global crop yields are rising, not falling. And listen to this. And while global atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are obviously higher now than two centuries ago, they're not at any record planetary high. They're at a low that has only been seen once before in the past 500 million years ago, as I have said repeatedly. So then we go on. Since all that data that, Dr. that Mr. Coonan uses are available to others, he poses the obvious question. Why haven't you heard these facts before? He's cautious, perhaps overly so, in proposing the causes for so much information, he, misinformation. He points to such things as incentives to invoke alarm for fundraising purposes and official reports that mislead by omission. Exactly. Let me touch on the CSIRO. The CSIRO has admitted to me we've had three presentations from the CSIRO. Under my cross-examination, they've admitted there is no danger from carbon dioxide from human uh, from human activity. They've admitted today's temperatures are not unprecedented, and they have claimed the rate of warming is, but their own papers reveal that that is false. There is no merit to this matter of public urgency. Madam Acting Deputy President, we say toss it in the can. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise today to speak on the matter of urgency. And um, I would just like to start by saying that there has been a crime committed here, and the crime in, is Senator McKim's motion is that it demonstrates a complete lack of genuine understanding and knowledge of basic chemistry and perpetrates 
John Kerry's apparent scientific qualifications and practical experience of oil and gas and energy in general. So it states to re release massive amounts of toxic methane. Well, sorry, when I did chemistry, methane was not toxic. It's actually a biologically inert and it is only harmful if it displaces oxygen, which leads to asphyxiation. Or in uh, large concentrations, it is, it is a flammable gas. So uh, if, you, if you strike a match and you're down a mine and there's lots of methane, it will blow you up. So it can be harmful, but it is not indeed toxic. And it is certainly not going to be deliberately mass released into the atmosphere. I mean, the whole, the whole point of methane is that it has a value. It's, uh, it's a valuable gas. And uh, when we talk about the oil and gas industry, well, we, we don't just take it out of the ground and throw it up into the atmosphere. We collect it and we do things with it. Uh, methane has many uses. It's uh, used in LNG, in, ironically, hydrogen production production of ammonia and other chemicals. Now, if we look at the Beedaloo Basin, which is, is what we're talking about, um, which is in, in my neck of the woods in the Northern Territory, and if we put the gas reserves into perspective, the gross potential revenue from the Beedaloo Basin would be in the order of $1.7 trillion. Uh, this is the equivalent of all of Australia's annual GDP. So we're talking about fairly high value commodities here. The development of the Beedaloo has the potential to create 6,000 jobs by 2040, and it would transform the NT's economy and supply gas into domestic markets for decades to come. Uh, 6,000 jobs in the Beedaloo region of the Northern Territory is absolutely massive and staggering. Um, his, historically, there have been very few labour market opportunities, other than the pastoral industry, in this region of the Northern Territory. In 2016, the region's unemployment rate was almost double the Territory's unemployment rate. Um, this likely understates the real jobless rate in the region, with only half of all people of working age in a job or actively looking for one. There are many more people that are unemployed than turn up on official figures. So jobs represent one of the best opportunities for the Beedaloo Basin and for this entire region of the Northern Territory. I know that the Greens don't care about regional Australia, but I and my coalition colleagues do. And in this case, so does Senator Watt and Joel Fitzgibbon. They know how important the oil and gas industry is. A couple of fun facts about the Beedaloo. It's approximately 5,000 kilometres southeast of Darwin, as I've said, in the Northern Territory. It lies between Catherine, 100 kilometres to the north, and Tennant Creek, 250 kilometres to the south. The Stewart Highway bisects the sub-basin from north to south. It covers an area of 28,000 square kilometres and comprises mainly of vast rolling plains. It sits within the larger, at 180,000 square kilometres, MacArthur Basin, which covers the majority of the northeast of the Northern Territory. Population is very sparse. Fewer than 1,500 people reside in the rural communities which border or lie within the Beedaloo. Most of the land in the Beedaloo is used for cattle grazing, and indigenous land practices. Perpetual leasehold covers most of the Beedaloo region and native, native title exists for most of these leases and the rest are under application. Um, Tennant Creek is the key service centre of the Barclay region. It has a population of 3,200 and the town has a long history of uh, mining and cattle grazing. Tennant Creek also has a strong Indigenous presence, comprising 51 per cent of the population. I would reject the premise of the Greens that um, Indigenous people oppose the oil and gas industry in the Beedaloo region. Many of them have engaged 
with oil and gas exploration companies and have come to agreements with those companies or in the process of coming to agreements with those companies because they realise that this represents their best opportunity at economic independence and jobs for their people. They, they know that at the moment there is very little to look forward to in the way of economy and jobs in this region of the Northern Territory. And they understand the importance that the development of this basin will play uh, in their economic independence. Now, that is something that the Greens do not want um, traditional owners to have. They want to keep them oppressed. They want to keep them living in communities that have no economic opportunity whatsoever. They don't want to see them lift out of a lack of economy. They don't want to see them get jobs. They don't want to see them get training. They don't want to see them get trades. They do not want to see the economic development of traditional owners and Indigenous people in the Northern Territory. Um, with regard to our future energy mix, we understand that gas has a role to play. Yes, solar and wind and a whole pile of other uh, emerging technologies and intermittent generators have a role to play, but um, they need to be firmed. And we understand that gas is one of the best ways that we currently have to do this in a transition to a future energy mix. Um, gas will continue to underpin these emerging industries. Uh, and, uh, Gas will be a way forward to go from a fossil fuel-based economy to a future economy where intermittent generators will have a role to play. Um, the development of the Beetaloo and the technological development of um, renewable gases such as hydrogen and biomethane will complement each other. Now, if we look at, uh, at where methane comes from, seeing as it's such a, an evil, horrible, non-toxic gas, um, methane obviously comes from the oil and gas industry, extracting it from the land and from the seabed. It also comes from biomass burning. It comes from livestock. And it comes from waste management practices. Um, if we look at emissions, the government's gas-fired recovery measures are a key component um, of our transi transition, as I said, to future energy mixes. And that may include wind, it may include solar, it may include pumped hydro, um, and uh, it, it also may include hydrogen, which uh, the Greens like to, to trot out as um, the future energy mix, the, the, renew, the renewable energy mix of the future, the panacea for everything that's evil about the oil and gas industry and fossil fuels. Well, let me tell you that nearly all hydrogen on the planet today is ironically manufactured from, guess what, that evil, evil methane. So does that make hydrogen evil as well? Well, maybe it does. Um, if the Greens truly want to go as fast as they can to low emissions or no emissions, then they should consider gas as a transition fuel and they should consider nuclear power generation as something in their mix of uh, renewables and uh, intermittent generators. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise today to speak on this urgency motion uh, and in doing so recognise the contributions from Northern Territory senators such as Senator McMahon. Uh, this is a um, an issue uh, that relates to the Northern Territory, but as we know, this is um, a far-reaching debate about much more than just one area of our country. It's about the government's energy policy. It's about where we're going in the future. 
and it is about the jobs that can be created right now and how those jobs are going to be created. See, the, the problem with what the government puts forward in these debates is they talk about a transition, but there's no plan to where they're going to. So they talk about a transition, but there is no support for, for renewable energy. There is a walking away and a walking backwards of support for renewable energy. And even as we've seen from some of the contributions today, a complete denial that this is something the government needs to address, that these jobs um, can be created and that they will uh, assist our regional communities, um, but that even climate change is something that we need to talk about in this place. So it's disappointing. I respect the, the, um, the views of um, the Territory and senators that have contributed to this debate, uh, but the broader debate around this government's energy policy is incredibly lacking. On the Beedaloo Basin, can I just say that Federal Labor respects and understands the Northern Territory government's support for exploration in the Beedaloo. Labor also understands that there are strong community views and concerns on the issue in the Territory. And that's why Labor will continue to advocate for the government and industry to continue to consult with traditional owners to ensure that cultural heritage and the local environment is protected as a matter of urgency. Now, under this government, we've had repeated attempts to put into place laws that will not do that, that will not protect the environment, that will not protect, protect cultural heritage. So again, we call on the government to do what is necessary under the Samuel Review and bring a bill to this parliament that isn't just a repetition of Tony Abbott's one-stop shop, uh, that we can actually move forward and get good environmental protections, good cultural protections in place to assist state, um, par state parliaments and to assist state governments to be able to do this work. More broadly, this motion uh, raises issues around uh, the contribution of gas and the contribution of renewable energy more broadly um, to the energy mix and where we're going from here. Labor has always continued to, to argue for urgent and meaningful action on climate change, in keeping with our commitment to reach net zero by 2050 and in keeping with our support for the de declaration of a climate emergency. Uh, can I say, uh, Labor's record in government was to ratify Kyoto, supercharge Australia's renewable energy sector and to put Australia on a pathway to sharply declining emissions. That's what Labor governments do. But this government has walked backwards from all of those achievements. Labor's position has always been that on matters that involved environmental and heritage protection that we must adhere to, defend and act upon analysis and research. This is science-based, and as much as members opposite want to come in here and give the Senate a science lesson, they are not the scientists. And we do need to listen to the scientists when it comes to these issues. Of course, Labor knows that gas has an ongoing role to play in both firming and peaking electricity, as well as feedstock for manufacturing. Where there is a role for gas to play in firming and peaking electricity and as a feedstock for manufacturing, it must be subject to rigorous independent scientific assessment, not scientific assessment from Senator Rennick over there, but scientific assessment that is independent and rigorous. Labor supports the Australian gas sector. Let's be clear about that. Australia supports Australia's gas sector and the jobs that it creates and the jobs that it supports right now in recognition of the important role in creating economic growth and exporting incomes, earnings and both job retention and job creation. There's no uh, opportunity here for the, the Greens to put a wedge motion through and the government to point the finger at Labor. Labor has a strong position on this and we want to make sure that that is clear, but we also know that we need to invest more money in renewable energy. We want to make sure that we invest money in jobs that create economic um, uh, development, but also contribute to our country's um, need to do something about climate change. 
I want to quickly address the comments that were made by the Deputy Prime Minister, the Acting Prime Minister this week, about climate change, where he again sought to frame this debate as a city versus country divide. Because let me tell you this, this isn't about regional versus city. Climate change is not a regional issue, it's not a city issue, it's not about baristas. Because the jobs that will be lost if we fail to act on climate change are regional jobs. Climate change is the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef that supports 64,000 jobs. Now, those aren't my words. That's the words of the member for Leichhardt, the special envoy for the reef. But this government isn't listening to their own members or their own scientific panels on this. The jobs that we will be created, the jobs that will be created if we do something and support renewable energy are regional jobs. And you only have to go to the wind farm that was vetoed by Minister Pitt, 250 jobs in North Queensland vetoed by this government, to understand that renewable energy jobs are being created right now in regional Queensland, but they're being held back by this government. And we also know that the communities that will be impacted if we don't take any action on climate change are regional communities. They're the, they're the islands in the Torres Strait that are facing uh, rising sea levels right now. They know that they may have to leave those islands because this government is failing to take action. So can we just agree that we this Time is a has problem? Expired. Sorry, Senator Green. Senator Steelejohn. We are in a climate emergency. We are in a climate emergency. And yet, across our nation, particularly in our north, the major parties are opening up massive gas projects, from the Beedalo in the NT to the Scarborough gas project uh, in Western Australia. Both parties are in lockstep towards the precipice of oblivion. Against the wishes of traditional owners, against the advice of the best science, against the common sense of communities coming together to oppose fracking in all of its forms, to keep coal in the ground and to invest in renewable energy solutions, this government and state governments like Mark McGowan in WA and Michael Gunner in the Territory are tramping over the top of the desires and wishes of traditional owners, embodying the very finest arrogance that white men have ever brought to government in this place, seeking to exploit and open up from the ground some of the most filthy fuel in existence that will supercharge global heating. This is one of the most disgraceful moments in Australian political history, when the world is moving to action on the climate crisis, Australia has dug itself in. The Morrison government, helped by Anthony Albanese's so-called opposition, is leading the charge of the denialists globally, blocking action on climate change left, right and centre, particularly here in the Asia-Pacific region, when our neighbours and friends are struggling with the reality of the water lapping round their ankles. We turn up to international fora after international fora and block action. Why do we do it? Why is it that these two parties are so willing to sell the future of young people, particularly in this country? Because they take millions for it. Because they are on the take. Two million dollars from Woodside alone given between 2013 and 2020 to the major parties. Millions more from other gas giants. And what do they get? in return. They get to be able to utilise their claims over the Fitzroy River 
in Western Australia, whether you be Boro Energy or Origin Energy or Black Mountain or Mitsubishi or Twiggy Bloody Forest, Excuse all me, are Senator. able to circle at the trough and pursue their claims over one of the last great pristine wildernesses in this country. And just a few weeks ago, we see the former Treasurer of Western Australia leave his position and join the board of Rio Tinto and join the board of Woodside and claim $400,000 for it. The disgusting, slimy uh, turnstile of Australian politics on full display. Well, we in the Greens oppose it. We are uh, united united in support for the community to keep the gas in the ground and go you, bloody Jordan, renewable. Your, your time's expired and I just comment on your unparliamentary language during the course of your oh. presentation then I ask you to apologise for that please. The, the swearing. Uh, the, the swearing or the, and the raspberry both or just the raspberry? Please. Both thank you. Uh, both the raspberry and the swearing? Yes thank you. I'll withdraw both. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. I rise to speak on the matter of public importance, ma Madam De Deputy President. The contrast is becoming so clear. As the world moves away from digging up fossil fuels, it is Australia's absolute shame that the Liberals are propping up oil and gas by funneling endless taxpayer dollars to this dying industry. No amount of actual science or the climate disasters that we have been witnessing in our own backyard the fires, the floods, the heat waves. Nothing seems to convince this government that digging up fossil fuels is dangerous in the extreme. It is killing us. It is destroying our livelihoods, our communities, and our planet. Just this morning, Mr. Morrison spoke via video to the oil and gas lobby's annual conference after being isolated and shamed at the G7 summit. We know who your real mates are. I can never forget that this is the same guy who brought a lump of coal to Parliament. The International Energy Agency has made it absolutely clear that if we want a future free from the climate crisis, it means no new fossil fuel projects, starting now, starting today. This means no more new coal, oil or gas. Yet this government single-mindedly continues down the path of the so-called gas-led recovery promising hundreds of millions of dollars worth of new projects and exploration. And sadly, the Labour Party is being led down the same garden path. This bipartisan refusal to take significant action against the climate crisis is leaving us behind. Any new fossil fuel assets will become useless to us in the next decade or two. At the most, the Beetaloo Basin drilling, the Curry Curry gas-fired power station, the Woodside Scarborough gas project, are all doomed to fail. But the government is only interested in spin. They are very focused on faking it. Faking that they care about, the climate, they care about climate change. Faking that they and their oil gas lobby mates are taking action. Their hollow rhetoric about technological change and emissions reductions means nothing as they continue to bankroll dangerous fossil fuel projects with tons of carbon emissions. But you know what? Time is running out for these climate criminals. Climate change has become a real problem for them because the community has risen up. Because people are demanding change and they are demanding change right now. And the Liberals will soon have to reckon with this. Or better still, they will soon be booted out with the Greens in balance of power and we'll push the next government to phase out coal and gas and transition to safe, sustainable jobs rolling out renewables. Senator McKim. <clears throat> thank, you, thank you, Deputy President. Well, if you want to know how much the world's changed recently, consider this. Last month, the International Energy Agency released its Net Zero by 2050 roadmap. And at the launch, the head of the IEA said this. If governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, gas and coal from now, from this year. Well, there it is, clear as day in black and white. Remember, the IEA were basically formed 
uh, uh, in 1974 to ensure the security of uh, global oil supplies. They've basically, for the best part of the last 50 years, they've been part of the fossil fuel lobby. And here they are saying, clear as day, no fossil fuels. They are done. They are over. We're living in a climate emergency. We need to change course, and we need to change course now. Now, this is the rational response of most of the rest of the world. In the face of a, a, an existential crisis, the world is choosing survival. Well, it's common sense, right? Or wrong? Not here in Australia. No, not this government. No, no, no. This government is happy to choose the apocalypse. While the rest of the world is going the other way, this government, with plenty of support I might add from its mates in the Labor Party, is trying to turn Australia into a petro-state. And a big part of their petro-dreaming is the plan to open up the Beedaloo Basin. This one gas field, the biggest in the country, would see the release of up to 34 billion tonnes of carbon pollution, the equivalent of 68 years of Australia's current annual carbon emissions. Now, why is this government apparently so hell-bent on cooking the planet? Well, because there's big money to be made in cooking the planet, and there's big money to be made in cooking the planet from the people who are donating big money to the LNP. Over the last decade, companies involved in Beedaloo have donated, wait for it, $1.4 billion to this government and, by the way, nearly another billion to the Labor Party. Now, those companies don't care about the future. All they want now is to squeeze another decade or two of obscene profits out of pillaging the earth and cooking our planet, and what comes after is somebody else's problem, according to them. Their view is pay off the, poly the pollies and party while the world burns. This is debased politics. It's a stain on our nation. It is utter, utter madness. And let's not forget the oil and gas behemoths who will profit from this madness, among them Santos and Origin, are also systematic and serial tax avoiders. So how does the government treat serial and systematic tax avoiders? Oh <laughs> well, by pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into their latest planet cooking venture. That's how the government treats them. This government has tipped over $220 million into unlocking the Beedaloo so that the big corporations and the billionaires, who've already got obscenely rich from cooking the planet while paying next to no tax, can get even more rich while pay paying even more no tax and cooking the planet even faster. It's morally bankrupt, it's economically irresponsible, it's planet destroying and it's stealing the future from our children and our grandchildren. Congratulations, everyone. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I've said it before and I'll say it again until you understand. First Nations people are of country. We are not just from country. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land, waters, air and sky of what we now call the Beedaloo and connected basins, the traditional owners that are still protecting country from desecration come from many nations and clans, but they have come together to fight for country. I acknowledge your struggle to protect your country. I support you, and everyone in this place must listen. They are standing united against the desecration of their lands and poisoning of their waters. They fight for country like their ancestors, their lawmen and women, and how their old people always have. They've maintained their country for thousands of generations, and, and you see what's just happened over just over 200 years. Absolute desecration of country. They're in parliament this week with one message. 
that together they will fight for country, and I'm proud to, to be able to join with them on their fight. For years they've been told lies by the gas and oil corporations, the very dirty companies that have brought so many of the politicians in this parliament. I've sat with those companies myself, like Santos. They've told me how they con our people. For years, our people have been told that there would be no damage to country. That's what they walk into communities and say, everything's going to be all right. We're not going to damage. They're lying. They're dirty liars going into communities, destroying not only country, but they're destroying people's lives. Lies that have been facilitated by the very politicians in this place that have been bought cheap by these dirty, climate-destroying gas and oil corporations. And yes, we know that you're in their pockets and vice versa. That is the problem in this country. Lies like the acknowledgement of country every morning. We do what? An acknowledgement to country. You have your prayer and then you do your acknowledgement to country right here in this chamber. What does that really mean, though? Do you really mean it from your heart? While you backdoor us and stab us in the back and, and rape and pillage our country and our water? Don't acknowledge country if you're going to go off and do that. These companies do not respect traditional owners. They have failed to properly consult. And I know Labor talks about consultation, but geez, Labor with their consultation are just as bad as the government. Consultation is not consent. Consultation is not consent. Don't think that it is, because you've been getting away with it for too long and both sides know it. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is clear. Free, prior and informed consent of First Nations people must be secured before any action on country. Are you doing that, Labor? Are you doing that, Libs? We know the National Party just don't give us stuff. So if that's how we're going to operate, you have no consent. We know Time fifty expired, million dollars went. Thorpe. Thank you. So the question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
Lock the doors. Order. The question before the Senate is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Eyes to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Seawood as teller for the eyes and Senator Ciccone teller for the nose. The old one's still on there. Senators, there being eight ayes and 37 noes resolved in the negative.